Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Biological Network Seminar, which will feature the developmental and organoids networks. I'm just going to give people a couple of seconds to join. Great. So as people are joining, all uh, right, the seminar series goals are to increase the biological network visibility and to spark new opportunities for collaboration and engagement. It's to promote coordination with other networks, such as the CZI seed networks. It's also to lay the groundwork for drafting the atlas and roadmaps in each biological area in preparation for the 2021 virtual uh, HCA general meeting. And this seminar series takes place the second Thursday of each month from 10.30 to 12 p.m. Eastern time. And we also are very grateful to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for making this seminar series possible. So if you have any questions throughout the seminar, we ask that you submit them via Slido. So what you can do is scan the QR code at the top right of the slide deck, and you can submit questions that way, or you can open up uh, a browser and type in slido.com backslash HCA bio network, and that will bring you to Slido. You can submit a question at any time by going to the Q&A tab, which is circled in red, and just so you know, questions with the most votes will be prioritized. So even if you don't submit a question, we ask that you vote on questions so we know uh, what the audience would like to get answered. So we would like to hear from you. So I'm going to open up a quick poll. So what would you like to get out of this seminar? I'm going to give everyone a quick second to answer. So I see state of the art and organoids to hear about interesting science. Give people a couple more seconds. An idea of what interests the community at the moment. Great. So keep those coming. Networking is another big one. And then how did you hear about this seminar? So please do take the time to fill this out. It's important. So we're able to reach you the best way possible. Right now, it looks like direct mail is, uh, is in the lead. Give everyone a couple more seconds to fill that one out. Great. And then our last question in the poll is, are you part of any of the HCA biological networks? So it looks like close to an even split. So that's great. And if you're not a part of uh, any HCA biological networks, you will have the opportunity uh, during our feedback survey to indicate whether uh, you'd like to join up with a certain biological network and we'll reach out to you. So the seminar format is, uh, we'll start with Paula Arlotta, 17-minute uh, talk, and then followed by five minutes Q&A. Uh, and then we'll turn over to Hans Klavers for 17-minute talk, followed by five, min five minutes Q&A. And then we will go into our breakout sessions, which is a separate Zoom meeting room ID. Um, and then we will come back from the breakout sessions to this webinar. Um, to wrap up. So I want to turn it over to my colleague, Barbara Troitline, who will be introducing our first speaker, Paula Arlata. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, and welcome to everyone to this exciting HCA Biological Networks seminar. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our first keynote speaker, Paula Alotta, who um, I think perfectly bridges the two networks that are uh, the topic here today, the, the developmental network and the organoid network. Paula is um, 
a um, uh, professor and the chair of the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology at Harvard University. She's also a co-leader of the neuroscience program at Harvard Stem Cell Institute, and she's a, a member of the Broad Institute. Um, something about Paula's background, she studied biochemistry at the University of Trieste in Italy before she performed a PhD um, at the University of Portsmouth in molecular biology in the UK. She then moved to do a postdoc with Jeffrey Maclis at Harvard Medical School. And uh, in 2007, she became uh, part of the faculty there um, as a professor of stem cell and regenerative biology. And she's still there now. Since, since her postdoc, Paula was really, um, has been interested in and has really done breakthrough work in identifying uh, neuronal cell type diversity in the mammalian cortex. She has been um, identifying different sub subtypes of neurons in the cortex, how these different cell types assemble into circuits and how um, these processes can be perturbed during development, neurodevelopmental and psychiatric disorders. Early on, uh, Paula has established methods to really you know, purify and sort out certain subpopulations and measure their gene expression. And in this way, she identified master regulators of these uh, neuro neuronal subtypes, such as, for example, CTIP2 uh, for one of the deep layer cortical neurons. And she also used this knowledge to pioneer ways to directly reprogram neuronal cell types and uh, as a way to regenerate the nervous system. She has really always been at the edge of technology. And recently, she has really pioneered and pushed the organoid and the single cell genomic fields. She has, um, with her lab, generated reproducible and mature uh, cortex organoids, which has been really um, a big problem in the field uh, to make them more reproducible and, and be able to mature them better. And she no is now using these systems um, to understand cortex development and, and disease. And I'm, I'm sure we will hear in Paula's talk about that. On a personal note, I have to say that uh, Paula is just a really ex extremely supportive mentor and colleague. And I think she has done an amazing job building a community um, through her enthusiasm and, and positive nature. So it's really great pleasure to have you here to, today, Paula, and uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Oh, thank you so, so much, Barbara, uh, for the very, very kind introduction. I'm, I'm really touched by your words. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for having me here today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And let's see here, just a second. Here we go. And I guess you can see the slides, right? Okay. Yes. Awesome. All right. So as Barbara said, uh, we have been interested for a long time in the lab in understanding the molecular mechanism, molecular logic more broadly that during development builds the brain. And, and in asking also beyond, um, you know, how the cells are made, how they come together, whether this process of brain development really requires an embryo to occur perfectly or can actually be in part at least fostered outside of the context of embryogenesis within stem cell derived brain organoids, much like the ones that I'm showing you here in this, in this picture. The part of the brain that we have been interested in for a long time is the cerebral cortex. We know that the cerebral cortex contains a very, very large diversity of cell types. And we also know that this diversity of cells and their connections really develop over a very, very long period of um, embryonic development that lasts a long time, of course, in human beings and is followed by almost 20 years of experience dependent maturation of the, of the neurons and networks that the embryo uh, generates. And, and this is what ultimately gives us a tissue that allows, at least in human beings, to do some of the most complex type of functions that we are capable of. And so in my lab, we have used two different model system at on one end, what I call the perfect system, which is really an embryo in utero to really understand how this diversity of cell times come about, how do they come together? How do they influence each other to then allow the cortex to function? Uh, properly. And I will say that is building on this um, work um, ongoing in the lab that we have begun newer work asking how much of the beautiful process of development can one actually reproduce in a stem cell derived 
cortical model, organoid model um, derived in the dish. And I should say that today I'll focus on the second, uh, because it's a short talk, on the second part of our work, um, telling you a little bit about human brain organoids to understand the corticogenesis and also to model uh, human disease. And we wouldn't be able to do uh, this work if we didn't have a fantastic collaboration with Joshua Levin and Aviv Reg for all of the computational analysis uh, of, of our data. So first of all, why do we even need models of the human brain? Um, from a certain point of view, it's pretty obvious that although the mouse cerebral cortex is very complex and very, very um, um, important and, uh, and a great model to study, there are fundamental differences between the mouse cerebral cortex and the human one. And that's not just because one is gerencephalic here and one is lysencephalic, but there are even cells um, and, and regions of the brain that are really not even there in a mouse that cannot be studied. The second is that we'll never have an opportunity to study it, I mean, the tissue itself, beyond um, rare um, you know, biopsies of fetal tissue that become, that become available, but those represent important but static picture of, of a process. What we really need are experimental models allowed to manipulate the system as well. And the third, very important, is that a lot of genetic work done in, the, in, the, in recent years has shown that for some prominent neuropsychiatric and neurodevelopmental disease of the human brain, um, those um, uh, are funded on very complex genetic uh, situations. Most of this genetics is, is poly, uh, polygenic, for lack of a better term, whereby many, many regions in the human genome would com confer a certain probability to the development, uh, development of one of these diseases. And so if we study diseases where uh, this genetic load is spread across, the ge um, somewhat spread across the human genome, then we need human models because animal models can no model this kind of complex genetic situation. And so a few years ago, and I'll just show you one slide here, um, when Georgia Quadrato was in my lab, she now runs her own lab at USC, we took on, we decided to build on the shoulders of giants here, like uh, Yoshiki Sasai and uh, Jorgen Oblich, and think about how far we can take brain organoids derived from stem cells. And the most important challenge to, that we pose for ourselves is how far can we foster this process of development, how long, because it, we know that it takes a very, very long time, even even in the embryo to build the cerebral cortex, as I showed you at the beginning. And so long story short, Georgia was able to extend development in vitro in these organoids from stem cells for very extended periods of time. And we are proud to say that some of the organoids that she seeded are still developing um, in the lab. And we are now analyzing to really understand what the outer boundaries of this type of biology really is. So we were very excited that this could happen because that meant that we could begin to study the cellular composition and late developmental events of, uh, of organoids. But of course, we found uh, pretty much at our first single cell sequencing experiment of individual organoids that there was a major elephant limitation in the room, which was the fact that every organoid um, would develop its own snowflake with its own sort of cellular composition, which was extremely different from what happens in a, in, a, in a mouse, in an embryo. And even organoids that produce a lot of cells of the forebrain were somehow are very different. And so we couldn't use this model as an experimental system, despite the great promise of having beautiful cells and um, long periods of development and nice network activity and so on and so forth. And so that's when uh, Silvia Velasco in the lab, now she's starting also her own lab um, in Australia, um, where she said, let's set up a lot of different organoid models and let's modify them so that we can um, we can extend their development and, and give them an opportunity to make many different cell types and then ask whether we can make the different cell types, whether we could start from any stem cell line that we want, but most importantly, can we make every organ we be in terms of its cellular composition like the, ne like the next. And so she started with a protocol that she adapted from uh, work of Yoshiki, uh, Yoshiki Sasai. And, and again, long story short, this is published. She succeeded as something uh, quite, quite impressive. So what you, what you look at here um, are organoids photographed um, through development up to about six months in culture. And we have now profiled um, about uh, 70 single organoids and multiple stages of their development for a total of about 500,000 single 
cells from multiple batches, from multiple stem cell lines, multiple experiments. I'm just going to show you here one example of this larger body of work. And so what you see here is a TSNE plot that shows all of the cells that are made in three organoids sampled at six months, uh, after six months in culture, and as individual organoids. And I just pull all the cells together to show that in this experiment versus this other experiment, in both cases, uh, all of the main cell types of the cortex could be generated. But most importantly, when we began to look at each individual organoid, they were basically indistinguishable from each other, which is really what we were aiming for. Um, and um, really show that it is possible not only to make a diversity of cell types, but to make it reproducibly every time an organoid undergoes development, which is exactly what the embryo really does. And so this opened the door to these organoids potentially being an important experimental system. And so building on this uh, amazing technology of being able to profile, as you all know, everything with single cell resolution across multiple modalities and so on and so forth, we invested heavily in understanding not only what cells they could make in the organoids, but whether in vitro compared to the embryo, one could foster an entire process of cortical development step by step, stage by stage in a reproducible manner, such that every time an organoid is collected at a given stage of development would be identical to the next organoid, much like it happens in vivo. And if that was possible, then begin to extract principles for how human cellular diversity of the cerebral cortex, which we have never understood in terms of how it's made or where it comes from, whether that could be studied. And so you see here um, a single cell level, the first single cell level atlas of development in these uh, reproducible organoid models done by Amanda and Anna in the lab. And they were able to collect these organoids at multiple st steps of development and collecting also multiple single organoids. And you can see here that independently from the stage of development that you're at, in this culture condition, we can get organoids that are highly reproducible and similar to each other. I don't have the time to show you all the data from the studies. They also did analysis at the attack seek level and by in situ sequencing. But this gives you a sense for how this beautiful process of development, and that's why we're very excited, can be used to discover principles of human corticogenesis. Not only every organoid at every stage made the same cell types, but if you look at the proportion of cell types that are present within an organoid, that's also kind of reproducible as well. And so here, for example, are in each column a single organoid at a certain uh, point in time from different IPS lines in multiple experiments. And you can see that there is a certain, certain um, relationship among the major classes of cells that are present within the organoids. So perhaps we will be able to study also relative proportions of cells and how sizes of these populations are established during human development. And most importantly, for what my lab is interested in, what I really would like to get to is an understanding of the molecular logic that builds these human cell types and have an opportunity to have a system that allows me to experimentally manipulate this pathway to really figure out functionally how we get the cells that are present in the human cerebral cortex. And in order to do that, you need to also have experimental systems where every time a certain cell type is made, the same molecular program, and I would say the same regulatory logic uh, is applied. I'll show you a single slide of this larger body of work where we have taken um, two main classes of cortical neurons, the corticofugal neurons that connect the cortex to, let's say, the spinal cord, and the callosal neurons which connect the two hemispheres of the cerebral cortex, and then um, grew organoid from many, many different cell lines in multiple batches, and ask uh, what uh, programs of gene expression define each one of these cells over time. And so here are the corticofugal, and you can see that um, across experiments, these programs of gene expression define the cell types are actually reproducibly made at any given cell type. And also, most importantly, if you compare the two cell classes, you find that there are blocks of genes, there's molecular signatures that indeed discriminate between these lineages, and they make sense in terms of what genes do that compared to the extensive work that we have done in vivo in, in the mouse. How similar 
and this process of development and corticogenesis in vitro to what happens actually in the embryo in vivo. And so what Amanda and Anna did here was to take uh, a beautiful um, uh, data set published by Dan Geshwin and um, uh, train a, a random forest classifier on the cells identifying the actual fetal developing cortex and then compare that, um, let the classifier identify cells in the organoid that would match to them and vice versa. We did it the other way around as well, as well as look at differential gene expressions on signature that define different population of cells in vitro and in vivo. And you can see here that is a high um, high, um, very good relationship and high level of reliability between the identity of the cells that are made in vitro and those that are made in vivo in this model and in these culture conditions. And I can um, expand more if you want about metabolic states um, and things like that. So with this model at hand, then uh, we have begun to ask how can we use it to understand not only the principles of human corticogenesis, but also perhaps aspects of human cortical disease that we have never been able to access because they originate in utero uh, and in the U and they are typical and they have typical genetics of the human brain of the human uh, of human beings. And so what we did here to ask the question of whether we could um, build on the genetics of uh, human neurodevelopmental disease through organoid to understand what cell types and what circuits may be affected in these diseases uh, without knowing anything about what, um, what these uh, specific genetic mutations would do. And we started with a set of genetic mutations that from genetic studies were associated with um, ASD. Here are three genes, um, KTM, uh, KMT5B, also known as SUV420H1, P10 and CHD8, three prominent genes, it's hard to put them together in terms of a priori, in terms of what, who, who they are and where they are expressed. They're expressed pretty much everywhere, at, at almost at every stage of development. Um, and so what are these excellent uh, postdocs in the lab, this is a mammoth kind of project that really required uh, collaboration among them. They generated IPS lines that carry muta heterozygote mutations like found in patients um, in them to also obtain an isogenic control line that could be compared to. And then they grew a lot of different organoids, both in the wild type, isogenic, as well as mutant background. And then use a lot of single cell, as well as small population, uh, molecular and physiological measurements to understand what these genes uh, do to the development of cell diversity and in general to corticogenesis in organoids. And the first thing that they saw is that um, in all three of these mutations, the mutant organoids shown here compared to the control organoids from the earliest stages of development were always larger than uh, the, um, um, the mutant were always larger than the isogenic control. And this was exciting to us because a high percent of the patients that carry mutations in these genes also present what is known as macrocephaly, which is an enlargement of the brain, but in particular, an enlargement of the cerebral cortex. And so this was exciting because it suggested that perhaps the organoids could be modeling um, further aspects of the disease. And so to um, really summarize a very long story short is also in bioarchive if you're interested uh, to the nugget, nugget of it. After a lot, uh, we, you know, we grew organoids from these three mutations um, and profiled them by single cell RNA sequencing as single organoids and multiple stages of development. And then compare control individual organoids to mutants across the three mutations with the ultimate goal of um, asking whether there were convergent mechanisms of actions of these three mutations. And what we found is the following. Two minutes, Barbara? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. And we found that uh, for this specific gene, SUV420, we consist consistently saw experiment after experiment that there was one defined population of cells. These are the, the corticofugal neurons of the deep layers that was always increased in the mutant compared to the control. And we repeated this experiment with uh, multiple times and we know that this is the case. So this was exciting because in a, in a, a large set of cells that develop within the organoids, different cell types, one specific class of neurons would be affected. But this became very interesting when we began to look at the other two mutations. We found that the P10 mutation actually causes an increase again of another population of cortical neurons. These are the commissural callosal neurons that connect 
the two hemispheres. And finally, the third mutation, the CHT8, causes an increase, as you show, show here, of neuron belonging to the inhibitory GABA um, uh, interneurons of the cerebral cortex. So now you have three genes that we didn't know what they did inside the brain, expressing every cell of these developing organoids and developing cortex, and yet affecting the production of very specific classes of neurons of the cortex. And when this becomes interesting is as we think about how these neurons then come together in the cortex to form the cortical circuitry, because they all belong to the micro circuit, local circuit of the cerebral cortex, really leading us to formulate the hypothesis that what these genes have in common are not necessarily um, defined molecular pathways or mechanisms by which they affect the brain, but they may converge on a common uh, developmental process, the process of timing of neurogenesis of individual classes of neurons, each permutations, which ultimately would converge on an abnormal, perhaps, cortical microcircuit. And we are very excited over the next many years uh, to follow this up with new genes and new measurements. So just to conclude here, uh, I think that thanks to the amazing technologies that uh, are available these days to um, profile with single cell resolution, very complex tissues like the brain or the cerebral cortex, we open a new area basically of understanding of these complex systems that we never had before. We also um, have the opportunity to access the human brain like never, never before. And not only the actual human tissue, which is very, very important, we should really profile to understand understand it, but also understanding how we can model perhaps its development through these organoids that for as primitive as they still might be, they offer the one and only opportunity to experimentally access our own developing brain. And with that, I will stop and just put up a slide of acknowledgement. Acknowledgement in this short talk, I mostly talked about organoid work, but there are many excellent students in the lab that are just interested in in the fundamentals of how the brain is made. That I also want to recognize here, and of course, our amazing collaborator, especially Joshua and Aviv, for all the computational work. And thank you so much again for having me. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Paula, for this fantastic talk. I think this was a really great introduction into organoids and, and uh, human development. So we have a couple of questions. If you have questions, please put it um, down on, on Slido. So actually one question, you showed how you can really get an amazing reproducibility in these cortical organoids. What was, do you think, the key uh, change that you did to the protocol to get them reproducible? How, how did you do that? Yeah, I don't think it's a key change to the protocol, although, you know, the, 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 the recipe for how to make them is, is out there. I think what we are seeing here, it's sort of a fundamental process that happens in nature during development evolution, whereby there are very strict mechanisms uh, that, are, that the brain does not deviate from when it makes its cells. And therefore, downstream of a process of correct patterning of the progenitors, in my opinion, uh, for example, to a dorsal fate, if you're trying to make the cortex, downstream of it, it's a very tightly and highly controlled, constrained, I would say, generation of cell types. So as long as the very early steps of development are performed correctly, then what comes afterwards in, ter in terms of making the cell types is a self- um, you know, um, uh, self-organized and self-controlled mm -hmm. process that can go ve very far in terms of terminal, um, you know, um, cellular diversity and identity of the cells. This is very different from, for example, building higher order structures of the cells and so on and so forth, which is a process that requires more than endogenous information. Actually, this le leads to another question. You, you compare to the primary uh, atlas, right? So, what, uh, there are two questions. How do you actually quantify the similarity? Do you have kind of an absolute measure for that? And, and the second question, how far in development can you go in vitro? I mean, when, when does this similarity start to deviate? When, when do you not get the right maturation anymore? Yeah. So, so far in terms of the developmental atlas and the comparative to fetal tissue, we have grown these organoids to up to six months um, because at six months we have the majority of the cell types that we, you know, that, that are present in the cortex and that can be generated in, in vivo. I'm not saying that every single cell of the cortex is made, but the major classes 
um, seem, seem to be there. And in terms of comparative to the fetal, we have done it through this random forest classifier whereby we take the classification of the fetal cells provided from the fetal single cell you know, databases, and then try to see how much uh, the, the classifier can actually identify the same cell types within the, within the organoid and, and vice versa. And this is not to say that they are exactly identical, but also by looking at, in addition to that, to gene expression programs and similarities, a lot of the core programs that define the identity of the cells, we study this a lot in the mouse, are, are there. Now, these are still cell in culture, and so you would expect that some metabolic states may be there just because you're culturing things and so on and so forth, but what we found in the study that with these culture conditions, you actually don't affect this matching of the cell types and, and um, to the human fetal uh, um, when we looked at more than, you know, something like 38 different metabolic processes, and that some of the cells that end up in the center of the organoid may be um, preferentially affected by hypoxia, but uh, the majority of the cell on the organoids don't. Now, what we really need are complete atlases of single cell, with single cell resolution of the fetal process of development. Those are sparse at the moment. Yeah. So somehow you're limited by that too, to really establish the age and how far they can go. Um, uh, yeah. That's, all. That's the aim of the seminar, so this, <laughs> or of the, of the HCA uh, in yeah. general, so that's yeah, we need these uh, references. We need those. We need those. And so I'm really grateful to the work of Stan and Arnold and, <laughs> and, and Dan uh, to try to build those. Those are needed. There's another question uh, regarding maturation. Uh, what, how much uh, electrophysiological activity can you measure? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have measured the activity in a variety of different ways. And the reason um, why we uh, never sort of push um, more measurement or electrical activities is because we were waiting to have a model that had a certain level of reproducibility. Now, with all the caveats that the neurons don't necessarily organize in structures like in vivo, like layers and precise circuitry, uh, these organs are quite, are quite active. Uh, you can do both the patch clamping and, you know, a record, but also more recently we've been doing 3D um, imaging um, of electrical activity upon infection of the organoids with specific, you know, calcium indicator and optogenetic construct. And uh, you can see actually quite a bit of active neurons and bursts uh, and bursts of activity. Now from there, how much of that information you can use to really understand how precise these networks are, that I think will take a while um, because of the lack of structure. But yep, they are active. Great. Thank you very much, Paula. We have to unfortunately move on. And before we move on to Stan, who will introduce our next keynote speaker, um, I just want to remind you that uh, after the second keynote talk, there will be these breakout sessions. And after that, please all come back because we will then discuss what was discussed in the breakout session. And there will be also an exciting uh, funding opportunity announcement uh, um, by Norbert Taverna from the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative. All right, uh, now I hand over to Stan. Hi, thank you, Barbara, and, and thanks, Paula, for that uh, excellent talk. Um, so I have the honor of introducing uh, uh, to you uh, Hans Clevers, uh, who um, uh, is a professor at the Hubrecht uh, Institute in uh, Utrecht. Um, I believe, actually, Hans started his career uh, studying T-cell development, um, which led him to the T-cell factor, TCFs. Um, and then he found that those uh, TCF uh, transcription factors were key missing, the key missing component of the wind signaling pathway. So he kind of jumped there to, the, to, to, to uh, making uh, really crucial contributions to the understanding of the wind signaling pathway, um, which led then to revealing the role of wind signaling in, in cancer, in particular in colorectal cancer. Um, and, and also, um, uh, building on that work, he found that wind signal was not only important in in development and in um, in cancer, but also in the in the normal adult uh, homeostasis of the intestine, and um, identified other stem cells that um, and, and factors that are important for the maintenance of stem cells in the gut, and really uh, making uh, uh, fundamental contributions to the understanding of adult stem cells and, and uh, epithelial uh, homeostasis. Um, and this in turn led to the identification of, of stem cell markers and to, to using um, 
uh, stem cell populations um, uh, as, as um, uh, sort of uh, genetically addressable models um, and leading eventually to the development of organoids, um, intestinal organoids and many other organoids and elucidating organoids as a, um, as a platform for studying human biology in, in 3D but in, in, in vitro in a way. So as you can see, Hans has jumped from one breakthrough to the next, uh, always following one, di one discovery to the next uh, logical uh, discovery. And of course, he's been awarded many, many prizes, uh, including the Breakthrough Prize in uh, 2013. Um, I could go on lifting all his awards, but then there will be no time for the actual talk. Uh, so please, uh, Hans, take the screen. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Stan and, and, and uh, Barbara for the invitation to speak. So I have 17 minutes, so I understand. I hope I can start my presentation. Yeah, so following up on, uh, Paolo's talk. Um, yeah, I'll talk about a very different type of, of organoids. I think that the two types, so the pluripotent ones that we just heard about, and the adult stem cell based organoids that, that we sort of developed, I think are very complementary. And I'll, I'll give, you, give you some background and then I'll, uh, I'll jump uh, to the analysis of a particular set of cell types in the gut that we have been studying in the past few years. Uh, using organoid technology. So what you see here is, is the gut, as we saw it about you know, 20, 20 years ago, when we realized that wind drives not only development, as Stan said, but also adult stem cells in the gut, but we now know probably- um, Apologies, apologies. We can't see your slides. Why is that? If you'd like, I can play them from my, my computer, but- uh, Well, I actually, I'll try to share in a different way then. Sure. Um, so just share my desktop. You see it now? It's starting. I will confirm just one second. I still don't see anything. It's oh, just yeah. it says, it says. Well, if you can play it, I don't know. So this has worked uh, the past year. Okay, I will, uh, if you can stop sharing and I'll share my screen and you okay. can just say next slide. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's what I was seeing uh, just now. Yeah, so um, so can you, yeah. Oh yeah, so what you see here is, a, is essentially the epithelium of the gut. The big structure in the middle is the is called the villus. There's a number of pits that surround the base of the villus. That's where the stem cells were presumed to sit. And it was known, so we basically read very old literature 20 years ago, that this system was, was the most active uh, stem cell system in the human body, in the mouse body, where at least in the mouse, the, the epithelium gets replaced every five days or so. So cells are born in the crypt, divide rapidly as daughter cells, leave the crypt, differentiate out into one of a number of cell lines, cell, uh, cell types, and then act for three or four days as you know, in taking up nutrients, and then they reach the tip of the villus and they die. Ne next slide, please. Um, so uh, as Stan remarked, uh, Nick Barker in my lab actually, uh, after we found that, that wind drives the cancers of this organ, but also drives the stem cells of this organ, uh, we went for to identify wind target genes, long list, but one of them was LGR5, and they made knock-in mice. This is actually a GFP CRE-ER mouse that Nick made in the LGR5 locus. So we now saw these tiny cells sitting in between the, the much larger the cells that are dark here, the pennant cells. Uh, and then with lineage tracing that I don't show here, we could show that they really are the, the long-term stem cells. One, well, there were many surprising observations, but one of them was that these cells constantly divide. And there was a very strong belief that that could not be possible, that stem cells would always be quiescent. So these cells go through a cell cycle every 23 hours. And in a mouse, this amounts to about a 1,000 consecutive cell divisions. And hard to see how they do this logistically, but that's actually uh, what we observe. And then based on this next slide, um, we then set out uh, to see if we could mimic the conditions in a crypt. And this was done by Toshi Sato, who you see here. Um, and we knew quite a bit about it. We had sort of randomly been knocking in and knocking out all sorts of things uh, over the, the previous 10 years and learned more or less the rules of what drives uh, the activity of crypt proliferation. Uh, three main factors, wind, and we took our spondin in our cultures, which was then known to be a wind amplifier. It wasn't known, we found that out later in some other labs as well, that is actually the ligand of our LG5 receptor. And, and we also solved how it, it amplifies wind signals. Uh, we added a tyrosine kinase receptor ligand, can be EGF, can be anything else. 
And it'd be a B inhibitor, it can be a small molecule receptor inhibitor, but we use the recombinant protein noggin. So three recombinant proteins, no serum in matrigel. The intention was to take one stem cell and produce many stem cells, but Toshi observed something very different and that these structures we now call uh, organoids. And what they essentially are is 3D uh, phenocopies of the epithelium of the, of the small intestine in this case. Um, and very surprisingly, the buds are crypts. They have the stem cells, the pennant cells, the daughters, and the central lumen that you see forming. This movie plays over about three or four days or so, uh, is lined by all of the other cell types of the gut. And actually, we discovered two new cell types uh, with Alexander van Oudenaar that were not known to exist. Uh, we first found them in these mini guts, and then we confirmed that they, they really exist. Ne next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, um, well, meanwhile, maybe one sidestep. Uh, Variations on the theme of the culture medium allow, allow us now and, and other labs to grow any epithelium of the human and the mouse body. And you start from a tiny bit of tissue, you stick it in matrigel, you add the right mix of, of, of uh, growth factors, uh, everything dies, but for the epithelium, the epithelium closes up, starts growing, and when the conditions are, are optimized, essentially they'll grow forever. Uh, and at any time in the culture, they will be able to, to make all the differentiated cell types of that tissue. Um, they're dumb, so they can only make exactly the tissue that they come from. I'll give an example from the gut. So you cannot push a small intestinal organoid to become a colon organoid. So in that sense, the, the, the full plasticity that IPS cells have, this could be the polar opposite. These cells are fully specified naturally. When we take them out, they can only make the bit of tissue where they, where they come from. Now, using these organoids, we could, and then knockout mice, we could actually solve the, the signaling code that, lie, that generates all of the different cell types of the gut. So enterocytes, 90% of all cells, wind off, notch, on. so it's wind, notch, BMP, as I'll show is crucial, and, uh, and EGF. And with those four signaling, uh, signaling pathways, by using them in various combinations, you essentially can turn organoids into any of these lineages. The, the hardest one was the empathy, and that's what I talk about for the rest of the talk, the enteroendocrine cells, uh, multiple lineages. There was a big debate whether there were 20 or there was just one that would, would express different sets of hormones and essentially were defined by the gut hormones they were producing. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so here you see a list. This is one classification. So they're essentially named after the hormones they make. Um, L-cell is very famous because it makes GLP-1 and GLP-2. Comes from the glucagon gene. And these, so uh, two drugs that essentially are inspired on the GLP-1 structure are now the two blockbuster drugs for type 2 diabetes. And what, what, what essentially these, these, these hormones do, they control appetite and hunger. So they have a, a central effect on your brain, they, call motil they, they control motility of the gut, they control the secretion of the, the gut enzymes from the pancreas and the stomach epithelium, they control glucose levels through insulin, that's what the L-cell does, and they probably control many other things that have to do with, with metabolism and uh, feeding behavior that still has to be found out. And what we wanted to know exactly how this, this sub-lineage uh, was made up and how it was formed, first in mice, next slide please. Yeah, so here you see a, a, a report that Helmut Gerhardt made. Um, so neurogenin 3 is a transcription factor that is, that is expressed very briefly at the onset of differentiation along this EEC lineage. You have to realize that a stem cell, a single stem cell, when it divides, makes two stem cells. One of them can decide to become an enteroendocrine cell. And what it does, it just upregulates neurogenin 3 briefly, maybe half a day, and then it's off again. And he utilizes it by knocking in a stably, uh, uh, sort of very stable uh, fluorescent protein tomato that's slowly folding and a very rapidly folding neon green that he made uh, very labile by putting an N Dacron sequence at the end terminus. And the idea would be, if you can advance, the idea would be that when neurogenin 3 pulses, please push the button, then, uh, oh no, so it's, it's an animated slide, you would see. Can we go back? Yeah, so so yeah, on my computer, so the, what you'd actually see when there's a, a pulse of neurogenin 3, uh, the, the double color cassette will be activated, but first it will only be green, and then it will be yellow, and then uh, after about 48 hours, it will be only red. So the color code of the cell tells you how far in this process 
the particular enteroendocrine cell precursor has been. And now the next slide. So let me make organoids from these mice. The, the, the big and the one on the rest should also play the movie. Can you, can you play it? Yeah, so the big blob, the green in the center, that's uh, autofluorescence of dead cells in, inside the organoids. But you might see uh, the, the green, for instance, on the left, that becomes red, little dot, and becomes green and red again. So, so it works. On the left is just the standard organoid where we have very few of these cells, they're extremely rare, but the gut's very large, so they still make a lot, cranks out a lot of hormone. On the right, you see conditions where we can, uh, growth conditions where we can enhance the formation of uh, enteroendocrine cells. Essentially, we take all the growth factors out, we block max signaling, and then uh, you see most of the cells that still can take on a, a fate, the ones that are in the buds, will become green, then become yellow, and then can, can become red. Next slide, please. Uh, so in this movie, can, yeah, it plays. So, so what we were hoping to see here, you look inside the gut, uh, villi, we descend into a crypt. Uh, there's the big pen cells and the stem cells in between. An early daughter would be a common secretory progenitor that becomes an enteroendocrine progenitor. This will now upregulate, and here you see how it's supposed to work. So neurogenin 3 is upregulated. At the same time, the cells become green. Slowly, they also become red and they start losing green. And then over time, they will, they will change color. So now we're halfway up the crypt, the cells are yellow, they mature further, and eventually they will end up as red. And indeed, when you look into a crypt, you'll see that at, at the base of the crypt, they're green, halfway they're yellow, and then uh, up the crypt, they're red. And now you can sort them out. If you, at the same time, you record their color and then you do single cell sequence, you have not a pseudo time, but you have a real time uh, a single cell based analysis of, of all of these enteroendocrine cells. The ones that are, have a color are by definition enteroendocrine cells. And this allows us to put together a tree. And I don't think I have to show the rest of this. Can we go to the next slide? Um, yeah, and this was what Helmut then observed. So in essence, there are uh, six uh, lineages. The one on the right, the enterochromaffin cell is quite well studied, it makes serotonin. It's the only one that's, that's a tryptophan-like molecule, small molecule, that is uh, not a peptide hormone. All the others make peptide hormones. Um, so as I said, some classifications would have 20 different cell types, they, all of them expressing a single hormone. What we find is actually there are five of these peptide secreting uh, lineages. And, on, and in addition to that, we found that uh, within each lineage, the cells come in two uh, versions and two flavors. There is a crypt flavor and there's a villus flavor. And um, what, what Hermut also described is when the same cell like the L cell that in the crypt makes GLIB1, key hormone uh, in diabetes, extremely successful drugs derived from this, when that cell leaves the crypt, it now switches to a hormone called neurotensin, which has the opposite effect. And for the, the other three days of its lifetime, it secretes neurotensin rather than it secretes, uh, it, it secretes uh, uh, clip one. Um, so in that okay. sense, we now know there are six lineages, but there, there, are, there are probably 12 states or 11 states in which these cells can, can uh, exist. Um, we also know very detailed now, in great detail, what surface receptors they express. You have to realize they, sit, they sense what's in the lumen of the gut. Nobody knows what they're looking at. They have very specific olfactory receptors, depending on their lineage, other GPCRs. So they must be sensing small molecules, possibly volatile molecules. And that then leads them to secrete or to not secrete their hormones into the, uh, the bloodstream that directly runs under the epithelium and then control motility of the gut, but also control uh, activity of the eyes of, of Langerhans and the pancreas and control, for instance, the brain in uh, stopping or uh, you know, the ghrelin will make you hungry, but some other like PYY will actually will stop you from eating. So crucial cells of which very, very little is known because they can, there are no cell lines. Mice have very different diets, but also very different enteroendocrine cells. They, for instance, lack the hormone Motilin, which is very important in humans. And so this is really is a unique platform, we think, to study this in humans as well. This all comes from a mouse model, but can we go to the next slide? Uh, recently, uh, Hugh Boehmer and, and many other people in the lab and also a number of collaborators, uh, they turn to human in, uh, organoids. As I already said, they really are heavily specified. So we can make organoids from different parts of the small intestine, duodenum, 
The ileum, both can be reached quite easily by endoscopy. So the middle part of the small intestine is far away from, from both ends of the intestinal tract. So we have far fewer organoids from those. And the colon, uh, so when we make organoids, they remember where they come from. Uh, these don't automatically specify their enteroendocrine cells. So you uh, inserted uh, neurogenin-3 inducible uh, expression vector linked to tomato, so we can see where this works. And a brief pulse with doxycycline now specifies the cells to become enteroendocrine cells. Next slide, please. Um, and this works very well. As you see here, T is zero. When we induce, they make large numbers. So in green, you see clip one. So this is an L cell, but an L cell in the crypt state. So here it makes clip one. This crypt to villus switch is controlled by BMP, which BMP is high on the tip of the villus. Wind is high at the base of the crypt. And indeed, when we, when we leave out the, the BMP inhibitor in the middle, that's noggin, and we go to the right, we talk, take noggin out and we add BMP, we now lose all GLIP1 cells and had to be stained for neurotensin. Now all of these cells have switched to expressing uh, the neurotensin hormone, which does more or less the opposite of what GLIP1 does. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and here you can see this. Um, um, if we, if we look at, at, at the different regions, so black here, the, the ones on the left are small intestinal organoids, proximal, the red dots are, are the distal small intestine, the blue dots are the colon. You can see the top markers should be in all uh, organoids, not in the colon, that works. But uh, gastrin is produced in the duodenum, uh, uh, CCK, cholecystokinin in the duodenum, but not in the ileum. And then at the base, for instance, glucagon, GCG, it's the mother gene that produces glucagon, but also produces GLIP1, alternative proteolytic processing, is produced by the distal organoids and not by the proximal organoids. So they really remember their, their regional specification. There are IPS-based uh, gut organoids, Jim Wells has championed this. They really don't have this regional specification. So they basically do a little bit of, of, of everything. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, by single cell sequencing, we actually, it struck us, this also led us to find out that there was a crypt and a villus uh, version of every subtype of enteroendocrine cells. You get these lines that cluster together, like at the tip, you have the MX and the XM cells. Uh, well, and then, so this again, uh, what we already seen in the mouse held up. So we have about six of these clusters. Next slide, please. Um, from these insights, we now think we can actually control what hormones are being made. For instance, if you add a BMP inhibitor or you knock out, I don't show this here, one of the BMP receptors uh, on the epithelium, you now force these L cells to throughout their lifetime make the GLIP1 hormone. So again, the GLIP1 hormone is this anti-diabetic hormone, fantastic drug. Half of its lifetime, it will make this. The other half of its lifetime, it made the bad hormone, neurotensin. This is controlled by BMP from the villus tip. And if you block that BMP with an oral BMP inhibitor, now, and I won't take you through this slide, but now these cells will never switch from producing GLIP1 to neurotensin. They will just, the five or six days of their lifetime, they make GLIP1. And we're actually uh, now talking to various pharma companies to use this to, to essentially control what hormones are being produced in the, in the crypt. Next slide, please. And so we are uh, again yeah, we're running out of time. Yeah, I have, I have one or two more slides where you very rapidly, this confirms in our BMP receptor knockout exactly what I just showed you. So you knock out one of the BMP receptors. They now can only make a GLIP1. They don't, they never switch to their other version, to their crypt version. Next slide, please. Uh, this again shows this when you block BMP. So there's another lineage. Tag one is normally a crypt hormone on the left. But when you block BMP, villi are totally normal, but now the cells keep on expression, expressing tag one high up the villus. Next one, please. Um, we can do, uh, they, they actually, in these organoids, they secrete, if we induce secretion, they secrete the peptides. And by mass spec uh, on, on supernatants, we see a large number of, of peptide hormones. Many are new. Uh, many are known as brain peptides to control against satiety and hunger. On the right, you'll see the glucagon, the, the, the gene, this GCG gene, how it produces glucagon in the islands of Langerhans, the alpha cells, but also can produce GLIP1, GLIP2, and another set of hormones. We have no clue what they do, but we think we have a, a model system now to study that. And then I think finally, uh, there should be a final slide. 
Yeah, this is my thank you slide. So uh, yeah, I mean, 70 minutes is short, but I think what this shows is you can actually use organoids to in, in great depth find out uh, things about rare cells difficult to find in the study in, in human tissues. Uh, we go back and forth, I don't show this here, so we, we basically heavily rely on the HCA single cell atlases. And whenever we see a cell type appearing in organoids, we directly compare. And, and when they are differentiated, they are identical. When they're proliferating, which is not a normal state, you have to filter out the cell cycle genes. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I left a little bit of time for questions. Thank you, Hans. That was great. Uh, yes, we have a tiny amount of time for questions. And um, the uh, top question here for you is uh, from the audience is, uh, have you ever tried combinatorial screening of factors for these organoids? Growth factors or so, um, so? I'm not sure exactly what this refers to. Yeah, well, so, so we actually, so the way we find the optimal growth conditions or differentiation conditions is by checkerboard, you know, just take all the likely uh, growth factors and do checkerboards and keep on refining them. Uh, if it's about, if, it, if we talk about drug screens, so if you make them from cancers, we have this nonprofit foundation, they now go up to about 60, 70,000 conditions. So combinations of drugs. Uh, when you want to measure sensitivity or resistance to particular cancer drugs. So they're not, not there in the millions, but I know there's companies building microfluidics robots that actually will, will allow to do, you know, to reach similar types of screens you can do on cell lines. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're going to have to uh, move on. So uh, I think the two talks brought it across, across very nicely is that organoids and development are so closely related fields. And this is really the theme of today's uh, um, seminar, but also of the breakout rooms that are now coming up um, to see where there is synergy between the organoids uh, biological network and the development biological network. Obviously, the two have complementary focus on the one hand, the organoids focusing on the in vitro conditions, perturbation screens, uh, whereas the developmental um, cell atlas focusing on the ex vivo um, study of, of human development. But there's so much uh, interrelation between the, the two. Um, so if you want to read more detail or reach out, here's uh, the information on the two atlases. Um, but the focus today really should be on uh, trying to identify synergies and to see how we can get to the point that we kind of seamlessly go on back and forth between an understanding of uh, development in, in primary samples, functional validation in organoids, uh, potentially screening in organoids, making better organoids, and going back and interpreting what we see in the organoids in the context of its in vitro, uh, its, in, in, its in vivo counterparts. Um, as the result, we decided to split the breakout rooms not by the two atlases, organoids versus development, but uh, across three shared themes, bioinformatics challenges, experimental challenges and the applications perspective with a disease focus. Um, so these are the themes for the breakout uh, rooms and uh, the uh, URLs are in the chat now. So please join the breakout room that you have signed up for. Please discuss, contribute as much as possible and join us again here at the end of the uh, breakout sessions for the um, summary of the three breakout rooms as well as, as the final announcements. Thank you. Uh, from the three breakout sessions. So I'm going to start off with breakout one, where it's going to be Sam primarily reporting and a few additions from myself and Deanne. Go for it, Sam. Okay, fantastic. Um, so most of the uh, conversation um, was surrounding standardizing metadata and, you know, how we take these, um, these complex data sets, but we're including enough metadata on how the cells were grown, the conditions, um, you know, what would that metadata look like? Um, and, you know, should we have a call to submit the right kind of metadata and to support the analysis and the, the integration of these data sets? And also thinking about, you know, once we're in the position where we have enough metadata, 
um, can we start looking back at, at previously collected and submitted data sets and diagnose, um, you know, what conditions they were collected under, but also diagnose any issues with those data sets um, and, and try to um, really solve any issues before integration um, so we have a, a more accurate representation um, of the particular tissue. We also discussed dissociation protocols in this as well, um, that it's essential to include that metadata. Um, so Moz, do you have anything to add um, to that part of the discussion? Yeah, no, I think it's great. I think there was a lot of appetite for cross-comparison between primary tissues and organoids and the importance of synchronizing metadata in terms of how primary tissues are associated, etc., with cultures from the organoids and how we do the light-for-light -light comparison in terms of the level of the cell annotation or cell label, spatial, functional, the challenges across uh, development in terms of the temporal kinetics of development and the differentiation of organoids. And this may be very different in vitro and in vivo and also different across species um, that we discussed. Um, also wanted to ask Deanne whether there was anything you wanted to um, highlight from our discussion. I think that um, having some external, I think you pointed out Muz, having some external um, committee, a group trying to set up these metadata standards for organoids across the actual experimental groups that are doing this would be really important because the computational people aren't uh, completely tuned into everything that would be needed for protocols. So this would be an important contribution that uh, Muz pointed out in the meeting. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, for the HCA moving forwards, these are initiatives that I think we really need to drive through in a coordinated and collaborative manner. So that's an one action item from our discussion uh, that we should develop in the uh, AGM further. Shall we move to breakout two discussion? Is that a uh, breakout session three, actually, we're waiting on we're Jason. Waiting. Um, actually, Jason uh, realized he has a meeting at now, so I will be reporting. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you, Barbara. Would you be able to sort of highlight the discussion points from breakout two? Yes. So, I mean, we, we discussed a lot about what an organoid atlas could look like and what is needed. And um, we discussed, uh, artif you know, we discussed different organoid protocols. Um, should one choose the best protocols um, and how to choose them um, and, and, you know, how to deal with artifacts that, that come in due to certain cultural conditions. And I think the, the uh, there, the feeling was that one should not, at this point, uh, restrict to certain protocols, but allow all the protocols, because even if the cultural conditions for the certain organ of interest that one tries to target are a bit off, the cell types that emerge and differentiate in the culture might actually still be, uh, you know, cell types you find in vivo, but they are not necessarily exactly the tissue you, you try to generate. So if, in, 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 for example, for the brain, you might want to make a cortex, but at the end you, you get the morphogens a bit wrong and you end up with a hindbrain organ, or that is still meaningful. Um, and one idea was what, to put really all the data together that has been already generated on organoids and keep doing that. Um, to, to kind of get a landscape of cell types that can be generated in vitro up to now, to also highlight what cell states have not yet been generated at all in vitro and, and you know, come up with new protocols there. And to see whether the artifactual cell states, uh, do, do they maybe even resemble some more disease-like uh, states? Um, yeah, so, so in, in a way, since the differentiation programs could be quite robust, um, and then still you might have some kind of off-target gene expression modules, um, it might be meaningful to put it all together and, and then just see what, what is the landscape of, of states and fates that is being um, populated. But this brings up another big point we discussed where um, eventually we just need the primary reference because without the primary re reference, we just don't know what we are making. And if you have an off target in your organoid, it might actually map to another organ, but for that, we also need that reference. So I think uh, the fetal, the, the primary human reference is extremely important also 
at time points that are actually modeled in orgonauts, which is preferentially quite early, especially in the IPS-derived ones. Um, a comment was there that there is also a mouse atlas, so one, one of course can, you know, there are maybe more mouse atlases and that could also already serve as a reference. Um, we discussed about robustness and reproducibility, genetic variability between lines, um, whether one should maybe have a standard line that everyone should use. Um, that was just a discussion point, no decision necessarily. Um, and, and there was also a comment that, that we can not only rely on transcriptomes to assess how good the states are that we make in vitro, but actually we need also functional assays, uh, functional analysis of the cells and not just computational and genomic analysis. Um, also, we discussed, yeah, to just put all organoid protocols on protocols.io and, and recording every you know, step in the culture to be able to really, um, at the end, go back and, and know how these states were generated. I think it's really interesting that the two breakout rooms have kind of like uh, descended on very similar, uh, you know, action forwards in terms of meta-analysis, standardization, and this kind of like a iterative back and forth between the reference athletes and the organoids. And I think yes. it's really exciting area to pursue for both networks actually mm -hmm. uh, you know we keep getting these thematic uh you know components again and again the, the 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 sort of like level of transcriptome annotation level of function so i think there are really good points uh, moving forwards yeah. uh, actually our last point was a computational yeah. one in a way so that you for sure also discussed <laughs> which is, you know, mapping Absolutely. Or when you have all the data. Yeah, sure, it's nice to bring it all together, but you need to integrate it and how not to introduce artifacts due to integration and how to really assess similarities. I yeah. mean, these are then computational questions. Absolutely. And perhaps there are lessons to be learned with some of the adult organ biological networks, such as the lung, where they've done a lot of this meta analysis. And mm -hmm. perhaps that's something we can take forward. So I thought I should now move to breakout three and ask uh, for a report back. And breakout three was primarily focusing on understanding development and disease. So I think it's Sam who, it's Sam Bajati, who will be giving an update. Sort of broadly speaking, two topics. We discussed application areas and and consider the challenges. I might just start with the with the with the latter. So in terms of challenges, the, the bits that we address is one one fundamental issue is the availability of organoids. And this is not about the data that's been generated from it, but the actual physical thing that, that in our view should be made available just as easily and readily as cancer cell lines have been in the past. And, and one needs to work towards ways of, of not ending up having to have complicated um, MTA structures in place that so would, would perhaps be helpful to have a sort of, I don't know, maybe centralized way or decentralized way of, of, uh, uh, of archiving them and, and straightforward ways of shipping them around. We talked about the need also to, to generate junk data with, with everything that is being uh, um, studied, both in terms of disease and the organoids, such as DNA sequence, and we also discussed uh, a very sort of specific utility of organoids to fire, fill in the blind spots in human development that cannot be addressed from primary human tissue simply because it is not available, either because practic as in, you know, it just practically is, is inaccessible or ethically is not accessible. In terms of application areas, we broadly subdivided this into rare genetic diseases, cancer, uh, fundamental bio biology, not disease centric, and de regenerative medicine. I can probably give a sort of uh, couple of headlines from each. So, in terms of rare genetic diseases, that as an example, we, we highlighted brain development, including uh, sort of maybe things one may not immediately think of, such as autism or specific uh, monogenetic diseases, such as neonatal diabetes. In terms of cancer, we thought about the cancer cells themselves, childhood cancer in relation to development, but also the microenvironment and how this can be modeled in culture. Talked about uh, uh, fundamental biological issues of, of making complex organoids and how to validate them. 
and in terms of regenerative medicine, thinking about lung repair after, after injury, how cells interact in, 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 in vitro system, particularly during tissue sort of repair. And those are the broad topics. Um, Christoph Sten, do you want to add anything to my summary? I think um, what will be very interesting and also very important is to demonstrate the human cell atlas can really matter for diseases. And that will need to bring together people with their very different expertises. And um, that will not be possible for all diseases equally. So we will have to identify some areas of kind of shared interest, critical mass and um, try and bring kind of connect more actively to co those or to connect actively to those communities who are really leading the, the disease centric work there and really ask kind of reach out and ask what can we do to make the human cell atlas as relevant to their work as we possibly can and at the same time use that as a, as a way of validating the the relevance, the, the impact of uh, the human cell atlas for, for um, drug development, for the development of better therapies. Thank you, uh, Sam and Christoph. And I think there are certainly a lot that um, can be done or needs to be done uh, moving forwards with engaging uh, the relevant clinical and research communities. And perhaps we may need to think about subgroups uh, to do this um, rather than to sort of like a, a general sort of like disease relevance uh, by highlighting some of these areas and, and setting that up moving forward. So uh, I think we're now going to stop the summary and move to the exciting announcement from Norbert Travers. Uh, just to summarize that um, it's very exciting. There's a lot of synergy between the two networks. And we look forward to sort of like finding new pathways of working together and making the developmental atlas and the organoid uh, network uh, all relevant for clinical translation. So I'm going to stop here and thank you. All right, good morning all. Um, so as many of you know, CZI has been doing a lot of support for the human cell atlas uh, to generate the early data. And now we want to start to think about what are those gap areas and so Tuesday of this week, we announced a new RFA uh, called the Ancestry Networks in support of the Human Cell Atlas to generate healthy tissue from uh, understudied and underrepresented uh, ancestries. Um, so these are three-year grants. You can read more at the um, uh, uh, URL that's there, and I put that in the chat as well. And so, as usual, we're, as we're funding teams of researchers uh, with various expertise, so computational biologists, single cell biologists, and also we're including uh, uh, community engaged researchers. And the reason for that is to culturally competently engage the communities that are donating these the tissue that we are using to build this atlas and to start to build out that pipeline so that we don't end up in the situation where we are in genomics, where it's roughly 80% from European descent, which does not make for a very uh, uh, completely useful atlas. So uh, the HCA has set up a registry. If you wish to uh, meet and build new collaborators, find new collaborators, that's available there um, on the website. And then just a reminder that the pediatric atlas, very similar um, setup, there's also a rare registry for that, and the deadline is coming up on March 30th. Um, so get your applications in there. Um, and if you've got questions, read the RFAs, please uh, email us at sciencegrants.chanzuckerberg.com. And if you want to stay up to date on our future funding announcements, um, the URL is there and in the chat. Thank you so much, Norbert. I will just share my screen here for some closing slides. So first, just want to say thank you to everyone who attended today's uh, Biological Network Seminar. The, uh, the seminar series is made possible through the generous support of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, so thank you to CZI. 
We want to thank the HCA Biological Network coordinators and members who uh, put a lot of effort and time into coordinating today's seminar. And also a special thank you to Luke, who helped run this seminar on the back end. So thank you, Luke, and Ellen Todras, and Tracy Andrew from the executive office. So thank you all for your help and support. A special thanks to our speakers, Paula Arlotta and Hans Clavers, and to our breakout session leaders, Deanne Taylor, Samantha Morris, Jason Spence, Heather Etcheverse, Barbara Troitzlein, Muz Hanifa, Christoph Bach, and Samba Jati. So our next Biological Network seminar will feature the Gut and Diversity Networks. It will take place on Thursday, April 8th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern Daylight Time. And registration is coming soon, so please check out our website. So if you would like to join any of the 18 biological networks, you can do so. You will get a feedback survey when you close out of this uh, webinar. You'll also be emailed the survey. So take the time to fill out the survey and to indicate what biological networks you'd like to join up with. Talks will be made available in the coming days on our YouTube and Billability sites. So uh, be on the lookout for that. If you are not an HCA uh, member, please go to the project registry link that Tracy will put in the chat and register to become a member. And for more information on the seminar series, just check out our website or feel free to email meetings at humancelloutlets.org. So suggestions, how can we do better? Really important for you to take the feedback survey. We do listen to it and we do uh, try to uh, tailor our events based on the feedback. So upcoming HCA events. So I uh, just mentioned that the Biological uh, Network Seminar featuring the Gut and Gene Diversity Networks is April 8th. Uh, the HCA Developmental uh, Seminar Series is coming to an end. Our last uh, theme for the seminar uh, series is on uh, pre-implantation, fertility, and gestation. Uh, the Americas, Africa, and EU edition will take place April 12th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We will have an Asia and Australia follow-up seminar the following week, so the third week of April. Uh, so be on the lookout for more information on that. Um, we hope that you can join us for the general uh, meeting, which will take place June 28th through the 30th, so save the dates on your calendars. And we will also have a developmental and pediatric cell atlas three-day meeting. It will be virtual August 25th through the 27th. So we hope many of you can join for that meeting as well. And with that, I would like to end and thank you all so much.